All right. Happy Friday, everyone. Uh, as you can see, I have dressed to blend in with our current surroundings. It's very gray outside, unfortunately. Uh, but it was not gray where these uh, rhinoceros auklets were hanging out by the shore. Um, you can see, perhaps see why uh, they got that particular name. Uh, here is a less spectacular but still interesting bird, the marbled marlet. Um, uh, mostly interesting because uh, it is near, it is an endangered species due to habitat loss since it needs to be at the water, but then also has to now fly long distances to get to the kind of forests uh, where it nests. Uh, here we have a uh, pelagic cormorant, uh, pretty colorful. Here's a, a sparrow making a lot of noise. And finally, good old American crow. So that's our birds. Uh, there are a couple questions that uh, came in on the check-in form today that I thought it'd be uh, good to talk a bit about now. Uh, one question was how do functions actually get arguments? As when we see something like this in assembly, we're calling the function foo, there aren't sort of arguments uh, that are part of this instruction to, to this function, so how does that work? So, the um, arguments are passed via specific registers. So basically, before the call happens, the first argument to foo needs to have been loaded into RDI, the register for the first argument. The second argument to foo needs to have been loaded into RSI. So you might have seen, you know, move whatever into RDI, move something into RSI prior to the call to foo, and so now it's kind of first and second arguments have been put in the expected place. Um, and the uh, instructions for foo will use these registers, assuming that they have the values of the arguments. Does that make sense? Um, <clears throat> Then there's a slightly more subtle question. What does calling a function do to current values of registers? Uh, and it, there are basically two options. One, calling a function cannot change the register, or, calling the, or the function can do whatever it wants with the register. Uh, and these break down into Two categories, caller saved or callee saved. Uh, and this is indicating whose responsibility is it to preserve the value of that is currently in a register if it will be needed later. So caller saved means that if whatever function is calling foo needs a register to needs the value in a particular register to stay the same. It's the caller's responsibility to save the value of that register somewhere, usually in memory. Uh, and you can see that the registers in yellow here are the caller saved ones. And you know it makes sense, for example, that the return value register, RIX, and our six argument registers, particularly the return value, if foo's going to return something, it needs to be able to change the value in RIX. And so if whatever function is calling foo needs the value of RIX for later, that's caller saved. It needs to you know, put it in memory, put it in a different register so that it will have it for later. The callee saved ones are the registers that I can assume whatever value they have before I call foo, they'll have the same value after. And so uh, RBX and RBP, in R12 through 15, these are our callee saved. And what this means is that if foo is going to, say, use RBX, it's foo's responsibility to ensure that whatever value RBX has when the function began, it has the same value at the end. 
And so this is typically done by saving the value that RBX has at the start somewhere where we can kind of get it back and restore it at the end of the function. And the place where this is almost always done is the stack. Just put the value in memory, and then before the function returns, put it back in RBX. And this uses an ins a couple of instructions that we haven't talked about before that interact with the stack and interact in a way that you would expect something to interact with a stack, pushing something on top of the stack and popping it off. So this is a typical pattern you might see for a Kali Sage register, where the function is going to use RBX. So we would only see this if the function is actually going to use and modify the value in RBX. This is a Kali Sage register, so we have to push it onto the stack to save its value and then pop it off of the stack. Uh, at the end, and so push takes whatever value you give it, stores it in memory on the stack, pop reads whatever value is on top of the stack, and stores it in the destination register. Does that make sense? Questions on this? What does push yeah. do again? Uh, push takes whatever value you give it and stores it onto the stack in memory. So if we the way that we'll think about uh, the stack is that it's a region of memory, and The stack will grow down because it starts at high addresses in memory, and as we add more space uh, to the stack, this region kind of expands into lower and lower addresses. So push takes the value, and we have a register that keeps track of what memory address is the sort of current top, current boundary of the stack. Anyone remember what register that is? Uh, yeah, our stack pointer register. And so push takes the value in RBX. Let's say RBX has X10 in it. So then X10 gets written to the kind of eight bytes right below the top of the stack. And then RSP gets moved down to indicate that we have added eight bytes to the stack. Yeah. Uh, can you illustrate more about like when it like grows down, like what is the top of the stack? Yeah. So uh, if we put actual addresses to this, we might uh, imagine that if we're dealing with a just for simplicity, not all like 64 bits of the address space. Well, let's say that our maximum address is FFFF. So that is the very highest address in memory. And so the stack is a region of memory that's placed at the high part of memory. And so if our current uh, stack, uh, stack point, our current RSP was, let's say, FF88, in order to add 8 bytes, to grow the stack by 8 bytes, what we did was we moved RSP from FF88 down to FF80. We moved the boundary down 8 bytes because that grew the region that we considered the stack. So that is what, what is meant by growing down, that we expand the stack by decreasing the stack pointer to be a lower address in memory. Yeah. So the reason we're doing this is to use the RBX register? That's right. If a function wants to modify the RBX register, 
it's callee saved, which means it has to make sure that that register has the same value at the end of the function that it does at the beginning. And so we'll take the value that it has at the beginning, push it onto the stack, so just save it in memory for the time being, and then right before we return, we'll pop it off of the stack, kind of move our stack pointer up eight bytes and read this value of hex 10 and put it back into RVX. Kevin. Um, so I have a quick question about like push and pop, right? So push and pop is not only really used for the stack, so then that means that like, in, in that memory also, right? Mm -hmm. After a function to finish execution, then the, um, everything below FF88 is going to disappear, right? And then RSP is going to be put back to FF88 and it's going to go to the next function execution. That's exactly right. Okay. Um, but one important thing that I'll point out is that when we move RSP around, like memory is not being cleared out, it's not going away or being created, we're simply changing like which range of addresses are considered part of the stack. Which means that when we move it down, if we don't write anything there, those bytes have whatever values they had before we moved RSP down. And when we deallocate by moving it back up, Again, those bytes stay the same. We're just now not considering them part of the stack, and they can be reused for kind of a future allocation of the stack. TJ. So what is going into the stack and what is making these processes of the thing that we want to do something for us? Uh, I didn't quite catch that. I mean, do, we, do we just push like memory addresses into the stack and we put like some other stuff in it? Uh, we can store arbitrary values on the stack. Um, so here we're saving the the value the current value of RBX could be uh, but that that could be you know it's eight bytes could be anything. So if that's the case then how when you pop something out how much how 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 do you know like how much you remove the other bytes in the stack? So it's in fact crucial that whatever value RSP has after we push here that it's the same when we pop here, because otherwise we're not going to pop the same thing that we pushed on. Uh, but that's the job of the compiler when it generates assembly for this function to kind of make sure that this kind of manipulation of the stack pointer is balanced in this way. Cecilia? So is callsafe more like a convention by the programmer and compiler than like a, like a factor of the Exactly, yeah. Simply a convention in how C programs are compiled and how kind of x86 programs are compiled. But yeah, not, not a fundamental part of the architecture. Other questions? All right. So some of that we'll, we'll see kind of more about as we, uh, as we go through today. Uh, the other... So the other question from the check-in form was, when we see something like this, what exactly are we doing when we compute this address? Um, and we have our base register plus our index register times four plus our displacement, so that's going to be plus Negative four. So we do, in fact, kind of subtract this four from uh, the, the result of uh, computing that memory address. So this is just saying kind of compute this memory address and then go four bytes above it, uh, 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 four bytes down in, in memory. Does that make sense? All right, there are a couple quick uh, practice exercises I'd like to do. <clears throat> so the first is we have a pointer uh, stored in RBX, and we want to 
we're considering what would the assembly be when we return that pointer plus two versus when we return uh, that pointer kind of brackets two. Uh, and this is not including the actual RET instruction. So uh, what would we, what assembly would kind of set either of these up as the correct return value? Uh, and there are different kind of variations A, B, C, D to consider. Uh, some votes for all our different options. Please discuss with your neighbor kind of what you think the difference uh, between these two is, how that might relate to the assembly. All right. Uh, large movement towards C. Excellent. That is uh, what, we'll, what we'll have for these two uh, returns. Can someone uh, share how you thought about this problem? Yeah. Um, so the first return is doing integer arithmetic, I think. And since uh, the value at p is long, uh, each long is eight bytes, uh, we'll want to uh, shift by 16 uh, bits. Or by so, so if we LEA, it will return the, uh, it will compute the memory address, uh, 16 bytes over RBX, then RBX. And the second return is like actually indexing, I believe. So we'll, the move will actually um, get the value of that. Exactly. We see here LEA actually being used to compute a pointer to do this pointer arithmetic, uh, whereas move actually dereferences the pointer, uh, reads the long from it. I say. Uh, yeah, I just have a question. So uh, I think last class you mentioned with like pointer arithmetic that like sometimes you can just be like like you could do like RBX plus two and if you know that the two means two longs, how do you know when like in which, like, what's the difference between? Yes, yeah, so uh, here we're seeing the difference between C code, which has type information. So we know that P is a pointer to a long. And so we know that when we add to it, add two to RBX, that means go two longs away in memory. When we're in assembly and we just have a register, there's no type information at all. So pointer arithmetic and the scaling is something that happens in C code and then gets translated into assembly where we're actually adding the 16. Or we're using something like this where we're adding some register value times four. What other questions do you have? Yeah. Uh, and it can't be 16 because we can only use hexadecimal numbers? It could absolutely be 16. It's that the move and the LEA are in the wrong because the LEA has to go with computing a memory address versus move when we're actually dereferencing and reading the long itself. All right. Our second uh, warm of exercise for a function that declares an array of characters and this is going to be a local variable, and which of these four instructions uh, would allocate the space, uh, or, or could allocate the space uh, for this array? Again, some votes for all four of our options, so please discuss with your neighbors why you chose the one you did. We're almost all thinking C. That is excellent. We will uh, subtract from RSP. Why would we subtract? Why? We're making room on the stack. We're extending the stack down 32. Yes. Exactly. We want to make more space on the stack. Uh, if I had asked which of these would deallocate this array, that would be the add. If we allocate by moving RSP down, we 
deallocate by moving it back up. Yeah. So like when there's no like remember when we initialize a stack, like it always just the the, the, the RSC always the pointer point to the largest memory address. Uh, can you say it one more time? Like when there's nothing basically going on and uh, you initialize the stack, is the RSP pointing mm. to the largest uh, memory address you have? Uh, when a program is initialized, there typically will be more than zero space sort of pre-allocated on the stack, because the RSP would be sort of, and that's uh, up to the operating system. So basically the operating system decides where RSP starts for a particular program. Oh. I guess I'm just curious what would happen with the call it to malloc. Uh, this would call the malloc function, and whatever happened to be an RDI would be the kind of value passed to malloc, and it would put in RAX a memory address of that many bytes on the heap. Um, and it is not relevant here because this is a local array, which means it must be a stack allocated array. Um, so yes, malloc could, could allocate, uh, if we were allocating 32 bytes on the heap, we would definitely see a, a call queue now. All right, so I want to kind of pick up with an example, the example I was talking about end of last time, where we see uh, the use of scanf to take a string and to pull six numbers out of it. Um, can someone uh, remind us kind of how the different parameters to scanf work? Anyone remember that from last time? Hear me? Uh, the first one is the input string, and the second one is the template string, where you're going to follow that rule to parse the uh, integers. And then uh, the next arguments are the addresses that you'll save those parse numbers to? Exactly. We have the input string, then we have the template or the format that says how to parse it, and then we have a memory address for kind of each thing that we're, we're parsing. And so because we have six numbers that we need to parse, SCANF needs six separate memory addresses, kind of each of which is where we're going to put uh, one of those numbers. Is it possible to not have all six following arguments after the first two? Um, like what happens if I only have four addresses? Uh, I don't remember off the top of my head whether it's a compiler error or whether SCANF will just like ignore whatever it parses for kind of that it doesn't have a location to put it. Um, as this code indicates scanf returns the number of things it was successfully able to parse um, and it may be that if you got rid of these two even if it was able to extract six numbers if it could only store four it would then return four um, but yeah I, i'd have to test it to figure out exactly what um, i suspect that it's not a compiler error because most mistakes are not compiler errors when we're in c um, but yeah, one of those, one of those outcomes. Other questions about this C code? Oh. So SCANF computes the number of times that it was able to carry that out? Uh, it computes the number of these percent symbols it that it was able to match up with something in the input string. Um, so it would, given this input string here, it would return five, as it was able to match up five of them. It would not be, not having a six number in this input string to match. If I, if there was some random string in here, scanf would only be able to parse three and would return three, because it would see, okay, this matches, this matches, this matches, and then it hits something that doesn't match uh, the format which would be, this is not a number. It would try and match this with this. Couldn't interpret uh, urge with as a, as a <coughs> decimal number, and so it stopped parsing. 
Wonders? Um, do you have to, like, this, could you define where you're sending what you parse within a scan app? Or is that, like, something you have to like, pass on? So, if instead of having the array declared in main here, if I Uh, did this and got rid of this. So like, this is what you're what you're thinking. Yeah. Um, yeah. So let's comment this out um, and look at. It certainly compiles, uh, and we can look at what this looks like in assembly. Um, what we see is uh, the compiler does not even bother passing these addresses uh, to scanf because it can tell that this stack allocated array is going to be deallocated as soon as this function returns. Uh, and so there's like no way that this information sort of escapes this function and there's nothing that it is ever done with it. So like if we want this function to read six numbers and like make that result available to whoever called this function, then it needs to like take in a memory address to be like, here's where I should put these six numbers so whoever called me can, can find them. Does that make sense? Yeah. The, uh, an alternative would be you use malloc to create an array of integers on the heap and then return a pointer to that, um, which would be a kind of different approach um, to read six numbers. But as it's currently set up, takes in an address and sort of that's where it, uh, that's where it puts these. Um, oh, that would be, I see, no, I was just looking at the wrong compilation. Um, yeah, so, in this, in this version where we have the array declared in read six numbers, it, we allocate space on the stack by subtracting 40 from RSP. And then uh, all we have all these LEA instructions uh, to kind of load the pointers to different elements of our array as arguments to scanf. Um, but we, allocate the space for this array at the start of read six numbers, and we deallocate it before we return. So it like doesn't stick around for someone else to be able to use. Angela. Yeah, so let me return this so that, um, So now we just have the, alloc the allocation for this array of ints taking place in main, since I've moved it there. Um, yeah, so let's examine like what this, uh, uh, what this assembly for read six numbers is, is doing. And We can think of main has allocated this array numbers on the stack. And an RSP points to the start of this array. Um, and this uh, whole thing was 40, uh, the 40 bytes that we allocated. Uh, and we can see that main moves RSP to RSI. So it takes the stack pointer, which points to the start of the array, and puts it in the register that's the second argument to read six numbers. So it's passing the stack pointer as this pointer to the start of the array. And then it needs to prepare these six numbers, numbers plus one, numbers plus two, all these arguments before it's going to call scanf. 
And so we have our argument registers. RVI, RSI, RVX, RCX, R8, R9. And we can see that these uh, first uh, were kind of taking four up from the stack pointer uh, and putting it in RCX. So RCX is going to point to the uh, element there in the array. We also moved RSI to RDX, and RSI was RSP. That's what main passed in. So our uh, RDX points to that first uh, element of the array, and this is kind of matching up. Our third argument to S scan F should be the start of the array. Our fourth should be the second element in the array. Uh, and then we see how assembly has to pass arguments when there are more than six of them. Because we just have these six arguments, uh, six registers that are used to pass arguments. And if there are more than six, any arguments beyond the sixth are passed via the stack. And so we see them being pushed onto the stack there. So we load the address of our last element in the array into RAX and then push that on. So we actually have a kind of pointer to our last element of the array on the stack. And then we do that for the address 16 bytes away from the start of our array. So our second to last element, um, not there. there. Uh, and then we fill up the kind of remaining two uh, uh, argument registers with elements of the array, R8 and R9. So all these LEAs are doing this pointer arithmetic of numbers plus 3 actually means numbers plus 12 because it's a pointer to an integer. And so 3 ends away is 12 bytes away. Uh, and so we LEA the address of the start of the array plus 12 to pass as an argument. Uh, any guesses as to what our uh, move.lc0 into ESI is doing? PJ? It's copying the template string to the second argument. Exactly. That we know S scans F second argument is this template string. And we can see if we look up .lc0 is indeed the template string. We don't ever see RDI being modified before we call scanf. That's weird. Why, why is the assembly not doing something to RDI? Yeah? Because the inputs are being the same. Exactly. That the first argument to read six numbers is also the first argument to S scan if. And so whatever read six numbers gets an RDI, it can just pass that along uh, to S scan if. Does this make sense? Questions on how this is all being set up? All right, so in the event where you are figuring this out for uh, the bomb, uh, you're really trying to nail down where in memory are each of the things that you are entering in your input string. Where are those ending up? So that once, so that you can follow what the code that uses uh, uh, that, that runs after read six numbers, what it is doing with your input. All right. Let's talk about secession. So, uh, 
today's first is the first state to secede uh, from uh, the United States. Uh, this was South Carolina. Uh, Abraham Lincoln was uh, elected in November of 1860, and the next month, uh, the legislature in South Carolina uh, got together to discuss whether they should leave the United States. Um, and as you can see, uh, they decided to, to do so, uh, and uh, in particular gave the reason that uh, they did not think that the federal government was going to respect uh, uh, the institution of slavery. And so it was sort of South Carolina needed to leave, uh, and over the next couple months, uh, several other states, uh, kind of the so-called cotton states, where uh, the vast majority of the uh, millions of uh, enslaved people lived uh, at that time in the U.S. So these uh, states in dark red uh, were the ones that seceded uh, in those first few months. And uh, this happened while uh, Buch James Buchanan was still president. Um, and his response was, I don't like this, but there's nothing I can do about it. Shrug. Um, there, uh, some of um, some of the other uh, kind of prominent prominent people at this at this time, uh, was of course Frederick Douglass, uh, noted abolitionist, uh, advocating for um, uh, a former slave, advocating for the the end of slavery. Uh, here's Jefferson Davis, a uh, uh, senator from, from Mississippi who would go on to become the president of the Confederate States. Uh, and the other kind of first uh, from South Carolina at this time was the uh, attack on Fort uh, Sumter uh, in, uh, off the coast of South Carolina. Uh, this was a kind of federal government fort. And uh, under Buchanan, they had uh, tried to send a kind of an unarmed ship to bring supplies to this fort uh, and the garrison there, but it was uh, prevented by uh, cannon fire. And uh, the fort was uh, commanded by this guy, uh, Major uh, Robert Anderson. Uh, and in early 1861, uh, this guy, P.T.G. Beauregard, um, uh, commenced a uh, bombardment of the fort. Uh, eventually forcing it to surrender. Um, uh, and this is kind of seen as uh, typically kind of the first battle of the Civil War and kind of began what would uh, be a kind of, uh, uh, the, the war that would uh, kill more, uh, more Americans than all the other wars uh, America has been in combined um, that would last for, for, the, for the next five years. All right. That's um, some history for you. So I think just to um, yeah, just to recap before uh, uh, before finishing uh, before uh, finishing with with uh, memory in the stack for today. More on it next week, uh, but. If we think about how does how does this automatic allocation on the stack happen? We can subtract from RSP we can push some value onto the stack that's going to allocate uh, eight bytes there. And as we'll talk about next week, call queue itself actually does a bit of stack allocation sort of in the background. Uh, and we'll see exactly how that works uh, on Monday. And if we're thinking about key allocation, uh, it's just sort of the opposite of each of these. So what would our, our inverse of subtracting from RSP be? And in RSP, how about the opposite of push Q? Hopping from the stack. 
and our kind of counterpart to call. Exactly. Whatever allocation call queue is doing, returning from that function better undo it. And this is it. This is how we allocate and deallocate memory on the stack. Can you say like call queue is a This is a, a teaser for Monday's class where we'll be seeing exactly uh, why call queue is in this list. All right, so uh, the other thing that I wanted to talk about today was uh, structs and how those are arranged in memory. We've talked about our kind of individual values, we've talked about arrays. Now the time has come to talk about how structs uh, are arranged in memory. So let's say we have some structs uh, that I'll call rec. It has inside of it an array of four integers, a long and a pointer to another one of these structs. And if I declare a struct rec uh, variable called r, I'm going to allocate on the stack a piece, uh, uh, a chunk of memory where r, let's say, let's make this. on the heap, so that R is going to be a pointer. And so R is going to point to the start of uh, this struct, and then, uh, byte zero. And this array here is just going to be contained entirely within the struct. How many bytes is our array A going to take up? Sixteen, because we have four times four byte integers. So we have the first sixteen bytes are A, and then the next field just comes immediately after the previous one in memory. Uh, so then we have I, which is the next eight bytes. Uh, and how many bytes is our third field next? Yes, it's going to be a pointer on a 64-bit system, so that brings the total size of our struct to 32 bytes. Just all of our different fields packed together in a chunk of them. The way that uh, assembly would be generated to interact with this struct is the same way that it would be generated to interact with elements of an array. Just taking the address of the start of the struct, offset by a certain amount. So if we had a function that if we wanted to take R and get the value I, we assign that to some variable, uh, we might have an instruction that says take, let's say R is an RDI, take that address, add 16 to it, move the 8 bytes there into some other register. And the compiler would, be, because the compiler knows sort of how far into the struct each of these fields are, it will just compile instructions kind of with those offsets hard-coded into it. 
So there's one, I guess first, does this make sense? Any questions on? Yeah. So every time you create a new variable, we can always be the Uh No, I just picked that arbitrarily. So there is one wrinkle, which is that the x86 architecture says that if you want kind of the most efficiency out of uh, accesses to memory, uh, you should obey what's called data alignment. And to motivate this, let's imagine that we have a processor uh, that always fetches eight bytes at a time. Whenever we go to memory, we're going to read eight bytes. And uh, the address that it gets those eight bytes from must be a multiple of eight. That it can't just kind of read eight bytes starting from wherever. It can only read uh, an address that's a multiple of eight because that's how uh, the memory is set up. If we had this processor and we had something like a double, uh, an 8-byte floating point value. Uh, if that double was split so imagine our memory is, uh, uh, looks like this, with sort of, these are 4-byte chunks. If our double were here or here, in these sort of aligned to eight bytes, this processor could just kind of grab those eight bytes and read the entire double. But if it was not aligned, if our double kind of crossed a boundary, it, it didn't start at a multiple of eight, in order to retrieve it, our processor would have to read these eight bytes and then these eight bytes and kind of combine the two halves of them in order to get this eight byte double. So this kind of rule that this works out to, and this is sort of typical behavior of the way computer systems interact with memory, um, is that If we have a value that takes k bytes, it should be stored at an address that is a multiple of k. This is what Intel says your program should do if you want it to be the most efficient on their x86 hardware. That you should make sure that all values are sort of aligned to an address that's a multiple of their size. By value here, I mean sort of individual primitive value. So char, int, long, a pointer, or structs, this is going to mean Structs are going to be aligned to kind of the maximum k of all of their elements. So whichever is the biggest sort of individual element in a struct, the struct as a whole will need to be aligned, will need to be stored in an address that's a multiple of that size, because that ensures that the fields of that struct 
follow this general alignment rule. On. Assuming that's size for everyone. Yeah, all of our kind of all of our primitive elements are one, two, four, eight, just those four sizes. Um, but there is also there's another assumption that we're that we're making that our struct is kind of when we lay out the fields in memory, they end up sort of arranging nicely so that they kind of each here, kind of each thing kind of fell nicely at uh, a multiple of eight. But that's not necessarily the case. Um, for example, If I come up with this struct that has a character and int and a character, I look at how that is laid out. My character C takes up one byte. If I put the if I put I starting right here, is that going to follow my alignment rule? Why not? Exactly. That what we actually have to do is just to waste some space inside the struct in order to have I appear at an aligned position. And then D can appear at it. And so this wasted space is known as internal fragmentation. So we have some space inside uh, our, our struct that we are wasting in order to align, uh, align our, our fields. Yeah. Is that fixed if you swap to get I in charge? Absolutely. There is a way we can reorder these fields because the compiler will just put the fields in whatever order you specify. It's going to give the programmer kind of ultimate control. Actually, the way that we order these fields, by putting I first, we could avoid this internal fragmentation. So oh. that, is, that is up to the programmer to see. Yes, I'm not, although I'm not confident in saying there is no C compiler that does the extra work of figuring out if it should reorder these for you. Um, but the most common case is that it will just take whatever order you give. And so it is possible to design a struct with more wasted space than is necessary. You should. So in this case, if you put in in the first place and have two cars full of it, it will still waste um, two bytes. That's exactly right. So even if we Put the int first, and we have i, and then c, and then d. The entire struct needs to be a multiple of 4, because that's the size of the largest element. So we would actually have two two bytes of external fragmentation to kind of get the entire size of the struct to, to line up. The reasoning behind this is because if we want to put these in an array, one struct after another, we need elements beyond the first to stay aligned. So we have to make the whole struct kind of fill that out. Uh, all right, we're past time, so I'll stop there. But uh, I know some folks might have other questions, so I'll stick around. Uh, keep working on lab two, and I will see you Monday. I have a question.